everyone welcome to the sprint 56 review uh the sprint just ended monday it was a regular two-week sprint as we've been doing in all of 2017. next slide please Next slide. I forwarded it. Okay. There we go. Um, as usual, I'll give the uh, overview for the sprint statistics. Carol will give us the update around the community. Dan will fill us in on the classic UI. Chris K on the service UI. Greg Bloomquist on the providers. Greg McCullough on Automate. Greg Tentel on platform. Alberto on the API. And Milan. Uh, we'll fill us in on QE. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, this sprint, we had 151 pull requests merged on the main repo. Uh, as you can see, the uh, many of those, 64 were enhancements and 45 were bugs, and the rest uh, evenly sprinkled around. Uh, next slide, please. Um, by area, we had um, 60 pull requests in the providers area, uh, 21 in core, and uh, the rest almost evenly sprinkled around uh, in the other areas. Next slide, please. Um, this is a new uh, slide that Marianne put together um, to show uh, the number of pull requests merged uh, per sprint across all the repos. Um, um, uh, the, the thing that we're going to add to the slide is the number of repos um, because my instincts are telling me that the more we extract the repos, the uh, more velocity we're going to get. So uh, the slide may be saying that, but maybe not. So I think we'll need more data to confirm. So we'll uh, keep monitoring this. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the uh, <clears throat> this is the number of pull requests merged across all the repos that we're involved in. Um, so the top ten are uh, manage IQ. Then the very close second is the uh, classic UI. Uh, then the integration test. Then the service UI. Well, then the docs. Then the Amazon provider. Um, and then it kind of drips off and jumps pending and, and the website and some other areas. Um, yes, I, I think that's interesting distribution. Next slide, please. All right, over to Carol to fill us in on, on the community. Okay, thanks, Oleg. So, uh, on the community side, um, last week on Monday, last Monday, we released uh, AOVA 2 uh, right on schedule. So, that was good. And then we have our regular and um, interesting last week in manage iq posts um i think both of them are doing this for the second or third time so and uh they're really interesting please uh, take a look if you haven't already and uh about events we have quite a lot of uh things going on i'm actually in singapore right now i just ended a couple of hours ago uh to attend fast asia so hi from the future it's not quite tomorrow yet there's another one and a half hours but uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, that will happen uh, in in a couple of days, and um, um, I think uh, unfortunately I received an email from Daniel, who was supposed to be presenting on Manage IQ Ansible. He had a family emer emergency and uh, was not able to make the trip. But um, well, um, uh, best wishes to him and his family, um, and um, hope we have him for uh, other events as well. Then following Fast Asia, we have a couple of meetups in one in San Diego and one in Madrid, both next week. And um, uh, so, so if you're in these uh, neighborhoods, go and support the um, Manage IQ meetups. And the uh, KubeCon in Berlin or Cloud Native Con, the other name. And uh, I think I mentioned most of this at one point or other. So if you want more details, just click on the links there. Barcamp in Warsaw, uh, that's uh, giving an intro to uh, Manage IQ because supposedly they, the, the community there doesn't know much about uh, Manage IQ yet. And then there's this a new meetup 
uh, organized by Proxy and KPN in Netherlands in Amsterdam on April 12th. So lots of things happening. Um, if if you know if you're near the, in in the area, please attend. If you want more information, just ping me. And um, this is future Carol signing off. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right, this is Dan. Uh, can talk about the classic UI. And uh, this sprint looks more like a three-week sprint with all the PRs that got merged. Uh, actually, there's a lot of activity in all the areas, and we had a ton of refactoring done as well as a bunch of enhancements. So you can just see the chart there yourself. You know, it's pretty pretty high, pretty impressive. Uh, next slide. So on the enhancement front, you can see a big list here. Um, I've got screenshots for quite a few of these, but um, uh, some some are. Um, Ansible related, just it's kind of spread all over the place. You can see a big chunk from containers, um, added delete for cloud object storage containers, there's some certificate stuff, uh, logging links, topology improvements, and dashboard improvements. Um, down a little bit lower, um, we got VMs in, in the infrastructure topology now. Um, there's some options now for service retirement. We can go through that. Uh, a custom logo got, got fixed up a little bit. And we have a demo on the uh, new physical infrastructure pages. So next slide, please. Kind of walk through some of these screenshots. Um, external logging link for container providers. Uh, really good implementation here. Um, you know, some iterative uh, changes on it to move the button around and things, but it ended up in a good place. And you can see there really good information about you know when it's available, what it's going to do. Um, basically, going to pop open a new window directly to the uh, to the external logging. In the provider, if it's not available, it tells you why. Uh, a good job on the container side. Next slide, please. When you click that button, uh, you basically get put in here. Um, I know I can't uh, read it, and I've never been to this screen, but uh, definitely gets you <laughs> gets you to the right place. So you can see uh, see obviously see your logging for the container providers. Next slide, please. Also on their dashboards, they've uh, added hourly and real time trends. Um, so you can see there, if it's hourly, you'll see the last 24 hours. If it's real time, you'll see the last 10 minutes. Next slide. All right, so inside the Ansible services that you can create now, uh, you're able to see the results for both the provisioning and retirement if it's happened already. So um, in, when you're looking at an Ansible service, you'll get actually two tabs there. Um, this is actually below, I, I chopped it off a little bit so it's somewhat readable. This is actually below the common information up on top, but you can see the standard output from the provisioning and a bunch of information about the plays and things like that. So that's a, 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 an improvement based on using Ansible within the product. Next slide, please. All right, pretty simple uh, diagram here shown by Lattice who made this change. Um, Basically, we were able to go down to hosts before, and now you can see there's a VM under one of, the, one of those hosts. Um, tried to blow it up big enough so you could see, but luckily he had that hover tip on there that shows there's a VM. Obviously, if you have a large system with tons of VMs, uh, the topology, I think, has, has a limit, so you should be able to uh, turn them on and off or, or only see so many of the VMs. Next slide. And here's uh, where you would actually build the um, catalog items for a service you're now able to use a playbook during retirement. So if you use a playbook, there's some new options there, uh, whether or not you want uh, Manage IQ to remove any resources associated with the service. So you can just say, no, I don't, you know, leave them there. Um, and that, I think that would assume that the playbook's gonna handle it. Uh, you can also um, uh, remove them before the playbook runs or after the playbook runs. So you, you have that control now. Next slide, please. And custom logo, you can now have the, uh, the option to have the custom logo follow the login screen, um, you know, customization. So you can have background and you can have your company logo there. Next slide, please. And for the physical infrastructure pages, uh, Julian's going to take over the screen and give us a demo. Hi, right. Let's just share the screen. Can you see this? We can. Excellent. Yay, right. So, um, 
So as you go over to the compute page, you'll see there's now a new item physical infrastructure. And so if we click on providers, um, as the name uh, explains, it's a physical infrastructure provider. So let's uh, create a new one of those. So let's just give it a name, uh, Sprint Demo. So currently we only have one physical infrastructure provider, that's uh, Lenovo X Clarity. Lenovo have been really great on this. They've basically done most of the work with just a little bit of input from us and some UI help from our planner uh, in order to add all of the back end stuff for the provider and add uh, the UI pages. So we just add in the host name and the port and the username and password. So just the same as every other provider that we have. And if we just validate it, done. And then we can add this. And here we go. And so we can now go and look at a summary page of uh, the provider. Excellent. So you'll see that there's um, the same information that you'd get for other providers. And if we waited around for a refresh, you'd see a huge list of physical servers that you can then go off and find out more information about but I guess we don't have time for a refresh, so I'll hand it back over to the slides. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. All right, so next slide. Talk about uh, some refactoring and uh, some tech debt and refactoring. So a lot of work going on here as well, uh, not only in our group, but in other groups. Um, some of the guys did uh, create some decorators to help uh, uh, have a more consistent have a more consistent way to display icons in the summary screens and the table views. Um, just makes uh, the coding a little a lot easier, actually. Um, containers did some refactoring and stabilization of their their metrics pages, their ad hoc metrics pages, and uh, working on some page title calculations, uh, which is basically getting the actual title of the screen. It's been done a very very many different ways across the product, so pushing that back to the controllers in a standard fashion. And then I've got uh, Martin. Martin P is going to talk about uh, the toolbar uh, buttons refactoring, which by the way, give a big shout out to Attila and uh, Roman and others that did uh, tons of PR reviews on this to get this done in this sprint. Uh, great job. I mean, this was a long, long time coming, um, but they're all done now, so that's cool. And then also uh, Martin's gonna cover some uh, refactoring progress on the mix-ins and give a, give a little bit of an explanation on how that's helping. So I'll turn it over to Martin. Next slide, please. Yeah, so as Dan said, uh, Attila, Roman, and Robin uh, uh, finished the conversion of uh, over uh, 260 toolbars that we have in the, in the application and more than 200 button classes. Uh, now we have a very simple way uh, to define uh, toolbars and buttons, uh, we have a clear separation of, uh, of logic belonging to a particular button. Of course, with IATN support and uh, potential for pluggability, because uh, what you uh, only need to do is uh, drop a file in the correct place. Uh, next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? it just hasn't caught up with you oh yeah so so yeah, yeah, yeah. so so this is the example of uh, what the button button uh, display handling code looked like before and what it looks not uh, what it looks like now we had a bunch of places where uh, basically when adding a button you you had to find such place and add a case or something like that maybe to four or five places now now you have a single single class uh, that's in a class hierarchy that implements the common behaviors of different buttons. So it's, uh, well, looks better, at least to me. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, do we have the next slide? Yeah, yeah. It's coming back. So, so uh, further work has been done on, on, uh, on uh, refactoring uh, to use the mix-ins in the controllers. Uh, well, uh, we are trying to separate uh, what is being presented uh, from how it is being presented, meaning there's uh, no, uh, there should be no mix of uh, markup and logic anywhere. Uh, we are trying to unify the behavior, uh, look and naming <laughs> between the controllers and uh, have uh, all, the, all the stuff behave and look similar. Uh, 
this uh, of course brings, uh, brings us uh, a lot of simplification and uh, reduces the opportunity to make bugs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with the declarative approach that we are using, it will be easier in the future to use uh, you use the API or use uh, this code through the API. So this is an example from a newly added controller. Uh, I think it was done by Milan. It's, it's adding an Ansible playbook. Uh, well, the code that you see is actually all of the controller. As you can see, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple. And uh, what you have by adding this code is you have a detail page uh, with relationships, with uh, with textual summaries. That's another file, and you have a show, show list, nested lists, and uh, and the main list of entities. So. As you can see, there is no markup, and the code is uh, pretty simple. We are trying to expand this, uh, expand this to other areas, so that we would have, at some point in the future, uh, nice, nice code everywhere. That's all from me. Returning to the uh, done. Thanks, Martin. Hey, Chris, it's all yours. Wait, thanks, could everybody Dan. make sure they have their mic turned off? Thanks. Anyway, thanks, Dan. Um, so just a overall progress for the sprint. So overall, we got um, 40 plus stories uh, done. Uh, next slide. And you know, since pie charts are the thing, I went ahead and, and threw a pie chart in. So um, yeah, next slide. Um, so this uh, this sprint was primarily a stabilization sprint for us, um, but we've got a couple uh, new things. Uh, one, we've added TypeScript support to our to the service UI. <clears throat> we've added the ability to edit orchestration templates. Um, the Ansible data is now displayed properly on the service details page, and we've begun adding RBAC support. Um, so as you add uh, roles or product features, uh, things will be added and removed from the service UI. And currently the catalog orders, requests, and templates um, pages are, uh, excuse me, tabs are done. And next slide, please. And we, uh, again, this, is, this was a stabilization sprint for us, um, lots of bug fixes. I won't go through all of those, but um, quite a few uh, fixes resolved there. And next slide. And I'll turn it to Greg. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, all right. So uh, just to kind of start off um, with the slow slide refresh rate over BlueJeans, which is not Marianne's fault. And uh, last night I took my first Zyrtec of the season. <laughs> I'm probably going to be a little slower than normal, but bear with me and we'll get through this together. Um, so today we're going to hear about uh, updates from uh, Hocular, <clears throat> Amazon, Ansible, containers, OpenStack, Lenovo, and uh, some core updates. So next slide. I'm going to guess that I, oh, there it is. Um, all right, so yeah, a graph. Uh, Again, we're seeing Ansible and Amazon leading the pack. A lot of this is because there's lots of features going on, uh, trying to get wrapped up in both of those environments or both of those providers. Um, yeah, so Ansible's way out in front this time. Um, we'll see how that kind of lines up for the upcoming sprints as we move more into like a, a bug fix phase. Next slide. All right, so on the Hocular front, um, had some updates around uh, uh, XA for data sources and presenting a, the correct icon for EAP6. Um, and next slide. For Amazon, um, Dan actually mentioned a few of these uh, in his updates, but they bear repeating. So um, got some operations for S3 objects and containers and EBS cloud volumes from our friends over at XLab. Um, <clears throat> and Brona worked on getting the AWS tags uh, for AWS objects imported as custom attributes. And we have some more features coming along those lines for AWS tags uh, in upcoming sprints. Next slide. On the Ansible side, um, you saw there were tons and tons of PRs for Ansible. Um, again, kind of like last sprint, those are spread across the entire team. 
Um, so there's going to be lots of things in Automate, and uh, you already saw some things in the UI. So for the um, for the provider side, we're collecting more credential details in the inventory, and James finished up creating um, projects and cred credentials through the Tower API. Um, and I actually wrote a code and uh, <laughs> added Im uh, embedded Ansible workers. Uh, next slide. For containers, um, reporting for archived container groups, and now also supporting custom CAs for uh, container TLS. And this is a pattern we're starting to see roll out across more of the providers. This allows, oops, looks like we jumped ahead one. Um, so I'll continue to talk about the CA for just, container stuff. Uh, it allows. <laughs> Predictive, uh, predictive computing. I like this. Um, allows the container or allows the user to specify custom CA for self-signed certificates for providers um, that which are like hosted inside an organization. Uh, for OpenStack, um, cloud tenant events were added to the timelines, and on the Lenovo front, uh, in addition to what Julian showed off, um, they also added event collection. Uh, so that's really cool stuff. Next slide. And on the core side, uh, Marcel's been working on a few different things. Um, one of them was uh, kind of defining a DSL for inventory co uh, inventory collections. Um, I've asked Marcel to start putting together some documentation for this evolving inventory SDK, uh, which is going to be really important. Um, in defining the provider integration strategies as we go forward. Uh, and also allowing timeline event groups to be defined by providers. And so before timeline event groups were defined in this one huge file with all the events from all the providers and Marcel's kind of allowing us to split those up uh, between the providers, allow them to define, define their own, um, not their own groups, but define which events go in those groups. Uh, so that'll be a really nice, a really nice change coming forward. Um, next slide, and I think it's over to Greg M for Automate. Yep, thanks, Greg. So, second week in a row, pie chart, 3D. It's all very good. Marianne didn't help me with it, but she gave me the thumbs up. So nice. Um, 31 PRs merged in the sprint. Um, a, a little bit heavier on the enhancements than bugs, but a lot of the work was around. The Ansible stuff, so we'll see that in the coming slides. Uh, next slide. This one, this is an enhancement that has uh, been out there for a while. We've been working on it. Um, the UI actually came along pretty early, and then we realized we needed a, a bit of work on the automate model to support passing the arrays of, of elements around when you multi-select in a, in a dropdown. So that work got done. Um, and then we had to kind of roll back to the UI and get this stuff merged. And, and at that point, the repos had split, and now we had dependencies. It was fine. But uh, Drew, you kind of got a lot of this together and stayed on it and bugged me consistently to get it in. So, uh, so here it is. It's a good um, a number of features. Uh, other features are kind of waiting on this to get in. So this hopefully uh, unblocks a number of other features that we want to do. So um, real quick, you just obviously multi-select at, at the bottom of the options when you're defining the field. And then this works for dynamic or you know static fields as well. So hopefully get good use out of that. Next slide. Um, right, so now when we're ordering services, um, since last sprint we talked about uh, supporting that from control for um, automate playbooks, I'm sorry, Ansible playbooks. Uh, we wanted to be able to capture where a service was created from. So the default is usually a user ordering a service either from the UI or through the API, um, but control is in there. In the future, we'll have alerts and we have the ability when you order from automate to pass along kind of a user defined uh, string but the, the idea here is at some point the the ui can take advantage of this information and show you these services differently so if you 
manually ordered a service, you might want to see that differently than ones that were generated for you from control. So uh, we wanted to be able to capture this data to help us uh, display these better. And then from some of the external teams, we got a couple of new service models in around the S3 storage and two from the container group. And next slide. So the bulk of the work has been here in the Ansible integration side. Um, really, as we're getting closer to, to kind of wrapping up the first phase of this feature, a lot of cleanup work of collecting additional values and, and setting relationships that we needed. Um, the, the UI that Dan showed for the service with that data, the standard out, all that stuff, um, it comes from this data that we've been collecting as well as uh, some work on the event side, the event modeling actually just got merged in today, but uh, the processing the events, we had to do some cleanup there and then some additional improvements to the state machines. And then on the Ansible Tower Gem side, we had an organization and for the standard out, we were always bringing it back as a plain text, but since you can access that from an automate method and you might want to parse that we wanted to open that up and so now you can specify the different formats so you can get it back in JSON or other more program friendly formats to, to work with. And next slide, I think that's it. Over to GT. All right, thanks Greg. Okay, so us as a platform side as well, the enhancements sort of outpaced the bugs a, a bit. Um, I'll go through the highlights of those. So next slide. So um, we updated Rails to 502. We were at 501. Um, LJ added a remote servers rake task so that you can see the, the, the full list of cross uh, distributed region. Real helpful when you're trying to troubleshoot um, issues, you know, on a big enterprise environment. Um, I'll show you a screenshot of that later. And uh, Joe V made a, um, an enhancement um, to, on the LDAP side, internal LDAP side, so that we can um, set the username using some other attributes when display name is not available. Um, there, was, there was a user that this was critical for in, in their Active Directory. They didn't have that for whatever reason. So this is a bit more flexible. Um, and a couple of uh, minor things down here. There's some uh, some tenant and and RBAC scoping stuff that Libor did as well. And Jason removed the easy crypto dependency from application altogether. Next slide, please. Um, some more work on embedded Ansible. Um, just some more hardening of the embedded Ansible worker. Uh, Nick and LJ worked on that. Um, and Shimon has been working on IPv6 support. He's done a bunch of stuff in the appliance console, some of its prep work to support um, entering IPv6 information there. Um, and some of it's also uh, the actual work. And there's, there's more PRs out there that'll get merged in the next sprint. And I'll be talking about those as well. Next slide. So here's a sample, hopefully that's uh, somewhat readable of the uh, full EVM status that LJ did. So you can see how there's a breakdown by zone and then a breakdown by worker type. This is gonna be really useful in troubleshooting. Next slide, please. And um, here's a just a screenshot of the change that Shimon made to the appliance console for networking. So now there's a, a, the network, individual networking options are now under a sub menu called network configuration. And you can see those are the ones that were previously there before, and it'll have IV, IPv6 stuff under there in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, some important bug fixes, a bunch of them here. Um, the one at the top there, um, LJ did to basically pre-configure Apache to have uh, 10 load balancer members at startup in this way when you change the number of UI or web service or WebSocket workers, we don't have to restart Apache. Um, this actually addresses an issue where um, Apache wouldn't shut down if there was an open WebSocket. 
it would actually wait for that socket to to be released and um, it wouldn't shut down we try and start it up and then you'd actually lose the ui because of it so this is a pretty important fix um another one that nick made uh been around for a while but it was kind of problematic to basically every worker was reloading the mtp settings um at startup and um basically it was it was causing a problem with system d it was kind of shutting it down because uh of too much activity so now it, it basically it's a small change but a big fix we moved it up to this server on the server thread um and it's only done once um the one the next one is an ansible one um that was a bug that was found in the embedded ansible worker um where some of the redirection was not working properly going through our Apache, and it was a small tweak that Nick made for that. And I won't go through the rest and look at those separately. Next slide, please. And some technical debt, um, just at a high level. Um, Yuri's been working on um, combining jobs and tasks. Some some of that some of the stuff there uh, was towards that effort. Um, some chargeback stuff that Shimon did as well, continuing to do refactoring there, and some some spec cleanup as well. And I think that is it for platform. I'll turn it over to Alberto. Next slide. Great. Thanks, Greg. Yep. So uh, on the API front, we had a couple of nice enhancements that came in. Um, first one uh, by Tim. Um, we have a enhancement here to. Uh, uh, add the missing post based the deletes um, on the following resource the collections templates services and service templates previously it was just the uh, delete action the http action but now it's the regular post uh, support uh, next slide please all right we have an enhancement by jillian uh, so this is for the service templates edits so previously we could uh, only uh, Added the base uh, the base attributes, uh, but now we also support the updating the config info. So similar to you know what's uh, uh, provided during a create, so you can update any of the information inside the config info. Oh, next slide, please. All right, another enhancement uh, by Jillian. Um, so here, uh, when um, yeah for services, we allow references of um, of object by href and ID, so similar to uh, again what's uh, specified uh, during create. Uh, here, as an example, you see the parent service orchestration template manager uh, identified by either href or ID um, versus just the the attribute parent service ID or what have you that you have. So this is again um, more parity with the way services are created. We can edit them the same way. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and here, yeah, an enhancement by Jillian. So uh, we needed to expose the authentications for the configuration script payload. So um, here we have the three examples. So getting API configuration configuration script payloads, uh, the playbook ID. You reference in the first example getting all the authentication. Uh, the second example getting a specific authentication out. And the third one is just getting the configuration script payload as including all the sub collection, the authentications um, with expand. So that uh, gives good flexibility here. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, a uh, new collection by uh, Daniel uh, for the alert definitions. So we have uh, API alert definitions and the full CRUD operations on that. Um, here giving examples of creating one, the test uh, test sample here. Uh, and then you have the regular gets on the collection, the resource, uh, the edits of a specific um, alert definition, the deletes, as well as the uh, action-based uh, delete and bulk deletes. Uh, off to next slide, please. Okay, and this is a, a precursor to uh, better setting support. So we've added uh, exposing the regions as a primary collection. Uh, so API regions, getting them as a collection, as a resource, as well as a bulk query. 
Uh, and the next one is we've enhanced the entry point. So when uh, you fetch to get the slash API of an appliance, we also return information about that appliance, including its uh, its own href and its zone and region hrefs. And that's it for the API. Off to QE. Hello. Hello, this is Milan from QE. And let's start with Ansible testing. We have finished our test case review and we have added the test cases to our test case management system. And we're currently expanding test cases for services. And so far, 53% of the features are implemented and ready for testing of which 66% is tested and confirmed working, and one third of that is currently being tested, and 47% is not ready for testing yet. Next slide, please. So, we also have a pie chart, and you can see the three most prominent uh, kinds of PRs are enhancement, then uh, test fixes, and then framework fixes. So that's pretty uniform distribution. Please, next slide. We have uh, finished our second QE sprint yesterday, and uh, what we have done includes also improved startup time for testing. We have uh, fixed uh, numerous tests, and we have also introduced uh, Python entry points, which will be used in future, for example, for uh, uh, external providers. So entry points provide a mechanism of discovering and others uh, packages, uh, classes, or whatever they provide. So our framework will be able to pick them up and use them for tests. And what we are planning next are more vegetastic conversions and uh, improvements for ease of use, like startup scripts, etc. Next slide. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Milan and everybody else. Uh, I'll open it up for questions if there's any. I don't see any on the chat. Okay. So if there are no questions, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for a great sprint. Uh, really lots of uh, pull requests and lots of uh, uh, they're translating it into actual features that, that are demonstrable, so that's really cool. Um, and uh, we'll be back in two weeks, same time, same blue jeans, and hope to see you all then. Thank you very much, everyone.